Abraham. Abraham probably won't see this tonight, but he might see it this weekend. Uh, he says thank you for sending that out. He said it was very well done. Um, so we're recording, and anybody that wants to join us on Zoom is available. Some people don't like Zoom, so we've got it also in another format. So welcome to Shema Israel. We are a Messianic congregation that is a ministry of Cornerstone Covenant Church, and we're grateful for the blessing that Cornerstone Covenant Church is to us. And we all know that tonight isn't Yom Kippur, but it is um, because of our our calendar and the calendar that we, we live with um, in order to have some significance. We are celebrating Yom Kippur, but we're celebrating it from a messianic perspective. We're celebrating it from, because we know that the Day of Atonement is basically, it's been fulfilled, thankfully. It's been, it's one of those feast days, holidays. It's actually a fast day, but it's, it's a holiday that has been fulfilled, and it's been fulfilled, as many things have been, many of the festivals have been fulfilled by Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And of course, so there's messianic significance everywhere, and really I think our task as believers is to study, to show ourselves approved, and to understand that even as we read everything in scripture, that we would understand the fullness of the message that's there, that's like, like is hidden from us in a sense, because it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. And I call all of us kings because we are, in a sense, we're not kings, but we're sons and daughters of the king. And so in a sense, we're like royalty because we're related to the king. And so it's our duty to seek out what's there in terms of the messianic significance. And so I'm not gonna read all of this part about Yom Kippur tonight, but of course it's based in, first in Exodus, and then more specifically, it's described in Leviticus 23, 26 through 32. So it's basically, but even for us as messianics, or us that are believers in Messiah, believers in Jesus, the Messiah, it's there for a reason in terms of it's a day of introspection, a day of repentance, a day of, of hope. Because we, we live in the hope of the resurrection. And our hope is that as our mission is to the Jew first and also to the nations, that we would be available to our Jewish brethren and our Jewish sisters. As Janet had lunch with one of her Jewish sisters today. Uh, who doesn't yet know the Messiah. So it's been our prayer that this young lady would, would come to Messiah, and we, sh we know that someday she will, because the word of God's promise is that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. And in a sense, she's not in our household, but in a sense, she's kind of our, our extended family, our connection. And we all have people like that, and we all have a chance to, to reach out. So, what we're going to do, ladies, we're ready to light the candles and begin our, our celebration. And uh, the good news about what we do, even though we have, we have an order, we also kind of move in the spirit and kind of, we don't have um, an exact formula for how we're going to do things. But, um, so we're gonna do, we always light the candles, and um, so I'm going to give the microphone to to Janet.
Serving of praise are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who hallowed us by your word and instructed us to kindle the Sabbath light and the light of the day of atonement. Deserving of praise are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who kept us alive and sustained us and privileged us to reach this season. So, Michelle, why don't you just say a few words about, the, before we do the Shema. Oh. Kol Nidre is the infamous prayer said at this time of year, especially, but also at, at different times, depending on whether you come from an Ashkenazi or a Sephardic background, you have a little different, thank you, I gotta eat the mic, <laughs> you have a little different understanding. The uh, Sephardic, I believe, are looking uh, forward in their vows, and they're being released from vows that they're going to make that they may not be able to keep, where the Ashkenazi, and if you don't know the difference, Sephardic are our Spanish, uh, out of Spain or Africa. Or Africa. Okay, I saw I caught, I should look like I, I thought, uh oh, what did I say? <laughs> Ashkenazi is more like from Germany, Russia, you know, the other areas, but that's the only difference. We're Jewish. Yeah. I, I really don't like to separate, but they have, you know, we bring our traditions. We bring, you know, if you ask Mama to make chicken soup and she was from Russia, she's going to make it different than if she was from Africa or from Spain. But we're still Jewish. Anyway, um, for the Ashkenazi, they're looking back on the vows that they may have broken and not kept. So it's just a, a perspective of which direction we're looking in, but it's a release from that feeling of guilt. Remember Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is all about being found without sin in God's sight, to be pleasing to Him, to be able to be written in the, His Book of Life for another year because you've been found worthy. So it's a recognition of how sacred your word is and how much you have tried to keep or will try to keep. But knowing that we're not able to perfectly do all that we say, this releases us, this gives us that, that break. It's grace. It's, it's pleading for God's grace so that whatever vows or oaths or pledges we've made, we're released from that responsibility if we didn't fully or don't fully attain to it. Uh, so usually they start with it. It is a beautiful prayer. It does honor our God, as many of our prayers do. But uh, with that, I think we're, we're starting you on to the tone of what Yom Kippur is all about. And it is that concern about sin. Something that our Jewish people don't like to think about usually, that they are forced to really contemplate why will God choose to write them in the book of life and do it for the next year. So we're going to uh, stand and face these, we're gonna do the Shema, and it's in, it's two places, so it's in the, the handout on the bottom of page two. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom, 
forever. So we're, we have a couple of stars in our midst. I don't know if some of you recognize our, our dancers from last week. We have two of our, our star dancers from last week. So uh, they're just not, they're not in uniform, so they're harder to recognize. But, but uh, thank you for blessing us by joining with us tonight. So, so now we have, actually, we have our minion, right? <laughs> Which is 10. I think we're actually at 11, 12 with the young one. So, and who knows, more to come. So, well, we, we know Fatten's coming, and, but, but our goal this year is to be more orderly and more on time because out of order comes spontaneity as well. So if you have order, then you can also be spontaneous, which is something that, that I try to be, but I'm not either one of those things. <laughs> so I've always said this, we plan for spontaneity. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so this is um, the top of page three. It's Psalm 103, one through four, which is, gives us uh, just, it's a great psalm for Yom Kippur. Bless Adonai, my soul, everything in me, bless his holy name. Bless Adonai, my soul, and forget none of his benefits. He forgives all your offenses and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He surrounds you with grace and compassion. So also the Amidah is actually part of really almost every holiday service, and it's actually Sometime we should delve into the Amidah, which is the standing prayer, and there's actually 17 parts of it, and we're not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to read some highlights from it, because I think it's so important that we understand the tradition, because the more we understand, the more we can come alongside our Jewish family, our Jewish brethren, people that you meet, and you know you can say to them, Haksameh, like good holiday. In fact, today I saw somebody who's Jewish and he said, well, you didn't send me a text this year. And I, what I should have said to him was, well, I sent you the text for like three or four years in a row. I thought maybe you'd send me one. <laughs> but anyway, um, so um, and we're, we're grateful to God because, you know, God loves a cheerful giver as well. And some of you know from prayer that we, I had a really unusual experience last week because I, I got a call from another brother who hasn't been here for a while, and he actually moved out of town, and he called me and said, this person wants to talk to you, and so I called this woman up and talked to her, and briefly, um, we just had this conversation about our calling to, to the Jewish people in the Palm Springs area, and she called me back the next day and said, you want to talk to me, and I said, that's great. She said, will you give me your address and the name for which I should write a check, and what should I put on the check? She didn't ask me to tell her the amount, <laughs> but she said, I'm gonna send you a check. And she's never been here, 
we've just had one or two phone conversations, and this week, yesterday, I got the check in the mail, because um, she said she wanted to send it to me to make sure that I knew that we got it. And um, her, her name is Frankie. So, Lord bless Frankie tonight. And she's gonna try to join us sometime, but I'm not sure when, but that was just like a really unique experience to have somebody that really, I mean, really there's no connection except another brother and the Lord. And she, I said, well, you don't have to do that. And she said, well, I do, because the Lord told me that I was supposed to write you a check. Meaning Shema Israel, not me. Um, thankfully, Janet and I get to do this out of uh, our, our being blessed by being involved in Jewish ministry. Because when you think about who Yeshua was, he went after the one and left the 99. And I'm not saying you guys are the one and the 99 is out there, but in a sense they are. The 99 is not, not in here with us. But, um, so this is from the Amidah. O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. You are mighty forever, O oh Lord. You bring life to the dead. You are powerful, able to save. You are holy, and your name is holy. Holy beings praise you daily. You choose for us your service from along all peoples, loving us and delighting in us. And you remember us in love, O oh Lord, this Shabbat day, Shabbat evening, and this day of remembrance, a day for calling the sounding of the shofar, a holy gathering, calling our liberation from Egypt. O Lord our God, be precious to your people Israel and accept their prayers. We give thanks to you, for you are the Lord our God and God of our fathers for all eternity, the rock of our lives, the shield that saves through every generation. Grant abundant peace to Israel, your people, and all mankind forever, for you are the sovereign Lord of peace. May you bless your, all your people Israel and your children everywhere at all times with your peace. So Lord, we just bless you as you bring forth your word and we're just going to take some time and, and worship the Lord together and just be able to hear his voice speak to us as we, we worship together. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
our speaker really doesn't need any introduction, so we're going to just let Michelle. Maybe I should just say for those that. Uh, um, you can you can always pray. <laughs> Michelle, you're wearing a mic. I'm not wearing a mic. Okay, I will be when I mic. do my message, but I'm just okay. doing oh, just the show. Have have I told him I didn't need to be mic'd till the end. That's all. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. So I didn't have to have a mic. I, I know. I thought she had to. The, because yeah. Roger has the other one set up. Yeah, Wait for I'm it. sorry, we, we didn't communicate clearly. I figured I was just doing the reading now, and, and I just, when Mike, when Mike wasn't here, I wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who are following, we're on page five. We're not going, you know, this is for you to take home and read too, like we did last week also. But I didn't think to explain earlier too, when I talked about the Kul Nidre, that's the evening service. They have seven services in 25 hours, two the night of and then five the day of. And uh, so Kul Nidre, what I explained earlier, was getting it started. And I'm also wearing the Kittel, or the Kittel. I'm gonna say it the right pronunciation now, the Kittel. Uh, which, if you've been with us at Pesach, at Pesach, at, at Passover, you've seen. But they wear it also, the, the fathers, the, the priests, representative, wear also at Yom Kippur the white, speaking of the purity, because again, we're trying to be pure without sin. And it also reminds them of the shroud that, that some are buried in, because this is a time that we are thinking about death. It's not a pretty word, it's not something that we want to put our minds on usually as Jewish people, but this is a time when they do contemplate, introspect, the seriousness of it. Thomas taking us into the Holy of Holies. Wow, you know, this is what it's all about, that we can go right into his very presence. We're not held out by sin. We're not held out by not having that relationship when we've come into saving faith in our, our Messiah Yeshua and Jesus. So, uh, beautiful that what you come to here is a messianic presentation of Yom Kippur. We cannot plead for our atonement because we know we have it. But what what joy. I'll say more of that later. I want to keep us on track because uh, I, I don't want to um, keep you here all night even though you should be here for 25 hours. <laughs> We're doing, and now I would say the Kudushah, is that your pronunciation? Kedusha, close enough. Pecan, pecan, potato. Throw. <laughs> we hallow your name on earth, even as it is hallowed in the heavens above, as described in the vision of your prophet. And the seraphim called one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his splendor. Whereupon the angels in a stirring and mighty chorus rise toward the seraphim and with resounding acclaim declare, Blessed be the splendor of God from his heavenly abode. For you, from your heavenly abode reveal yourself, O our King. Rule over us, for we wait for you. O when will you roll in Zion? Quickly, even in our lifetime, establish your residence there forever. May you be exalted and hallowed in Yerushalayim your city for all generations and through eternity. This is the prayer for the God of heaven to be ruling on earth in the same way that all of heaven and all of earth would be glorifying him. Oh, let, your, let our eyes see the establishment of your kingdom, fulfilling the word that was spoken in the inspired Psalms of David, your righteous anointed. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, shall be sovereign for all generations. Hallelujah. And as, it, as it is written in Habakkuk, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. It's therefore incumbent upon us to confess our sins. And then we go into the sins that we are guilty of. And there's a list, we go through it alphabetically, but it is, again, they're to be ch checking themselves. Where are we out of line? Where must we get right with our God? We are guilty of arrogance, blasphemy, corruption, dereliction, evil, counsel, frivolity, guile, hypocrisy, insolence, jealousy, levity, medacity, nefariousness, obstinacy, profanity, Quarrellessness, rebelliousness, 
slander, transgression, and righteousness, villain, wrongdoing, and zealotry. We have turned aside from your commandments and your good instructions, and it has not profited us. But you are just concerning all that has come upon us, for you have done truly, but we have dealt wickedly. And it is a time now where they would take time for silent prayer to confess before our Father, who is acting as judge at this time. On Yom Kippur, we see him as the judge. We see him as king also, but as judge. So even now, take a moment and just spend this time thankful that, yes, we've been forgiven, but to confess anything that's breaking our relationship with our Father. Our Father, our King, we have no King but you. Our Father, our King, deal with us kindly for the sake of your name. Our Father, our King, renew us for a good year. Our Father, our King, we have sinned before you. Our Father, our King, annul all evil decrees against us. Our Father, our King, thwart the plans of our enemies. Our Father, our King, frustrate the counsel of our foes. Our Father, our King, rid us of every oppressor and adversary. Our Father, our King, close the mouths of our adversaries and attackers. Our Father, our King, remove disease, sword, famine, captivity, destruction, iniquity, and persecution from your people of the covenant. Our Father, our King, forgive and pardon all our sins. Our Father, our King, remove our transgressions and sins from your sight. Our Father, our King, bring us back in real repentance to you. Our Father, our King, heal the sick among your people. Our Father, our King, raise the strength of your Messiah. Our Father, our King, strengthen Israel, your people. Our Father, our King, send us not empty-handed from your presence. Our Father, our King, remember we are but dust. Our Father, our King, have compassion on us, on our children, on our infants. Our Father, our King, act for the sake of those who were killed for your holy name. Our Father, our King, do it for your sake, if not for ours. Our Father, our King, do it for the sake of your abundant mercy. Our Father, our King, be gracious to us, answer us, though we have no merits. Deal graciously and kindly with us and deliver us, our Father, our King. Do it for the sake of our Messiah, Yeshua, and in his name. So we're in the middle of page seven. Uh, why don't we um, stand and um, say this together? Um, this is uh, a prayer. So um, Roger's ready. Ready. Uh, begin. Our righteous anointed is departed from us. Horror has seized us, and we have done to justify us. He has borne the yoke of our iniquities and our transgressions and is wounded because of our transgression. He bears our sins on his shoulder that we may find pardon for our iniquities. He shall be healed for his wounds at the time of that eternal will bring him anew. Hasten the day when we will assemble us a second time by the hand of the one who shall endure forever. Um, so we're going to, um, the, Janet, do you want to come do the half Kaddish? What? We already did it? No. Well, it's on page seven. No, I know, it's the Elaine. Elaine, okay.
always doing this. <laughs> but I have a microphone now. <laughs> so, I want to say that this is a very sacred time. If you haven't gotten that already, and for those of you who don't know how, what this means, um, this time and these prayers, as Rochelle said, you know, we spend 25 hours atoning for our sins, which really isn't enough. And we have just a tiny little portion here, but it's enough for our hearts to be revealed to him through these pages. And Bruce referred it to the half Kaddish, which I'm not sure it is, but it is the Aleinu. It's called the Aleinu, which is why it says that. It is necessary for us to praise the master of all, to exalt the creator of the world, for he has made us distinct from the nations and unique among the families of the earth. Our destiny is not like theirs. Our calling is our task. We bow down and acknowledge before the King of Kings that there is none like him. For he stretched forth the heavens like a tent and established the earth. Truly, there is none like our Lord and King. As the Torah says, you shall know this day and reflect in your heart that it is the Lord who is God in the heavens above on the earth beneath, there is none else. We hope, O oh Lord our God, to soon behold your majestic glory when all abominations shall be removed and all false gods shall be at an end. Then shall the word be perfected under the rule of the Lord Almighty, and all mankind shall call upon your name. For to you every knee must bow, and every tongue declare that you are God. Reign over us soon and forever. May the kingdom of David's greater son be established forever. For then shall the words be fulfilled, the Lord shall be king forever, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord shall be Lord alone, and his name unique among all of We can read Psalm 32, 1 through 5. How blessed are those whose offense is forgiven, those whose sin is covered. How blessed those to whom Adonai imputes no guilt, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away because of my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy on me. The sap in me dried up as in a summer drought. When I acknowledged my sin to you and I stopped concealing my guilt and said, I will confess my offenses to Adonai, then you, you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. Because Yeshua, our Messiah, died for us and rose from the dead, we can now say, Olam We have been inscribed in the book of life forever. So, of course, the this whole day uh, of Yom Kippur is really based on, on Leviticus. Um, you can stay here for a minute. <laughs> so this is from Leviticus 16, 15 through 16, and it's, it's at the bottom of page 8, and then 17, 1, and 11. Next, he is to slaughter the goat of the sin offering, for which is for the people, bring its blood inside the curtain, and do with its blood as he did with the bull's blood, sprinkling it on the ark cover and in front of the ark cover. He will make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, for which there is with them right in the middle of their uncleanliness. Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel. Tell them that this is what Adonai has ordered. For the life of a creature is in the blood, 
and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves, for it is in the blood that makes atonement because of the life. Now he provides that atonement through Yeshua, our Messiah, as he explains to us. Janet. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but this Yom Kippur was different for me. Um, he took me to another place to the Holy of Holies. And I am so grateful for the time with the Lord on Yom Kippur because I feel I'm different. I don't know what God did, but it'll be soon revealed. Um, on Hebrews 9, 13 and 14, I'll read that in a minute, Bruce. We find that instead of an outward purification, the Spirit of the Lord works on us internally, causing your consciousness to be clean so we can see clearly. So for me, I ask the Lord to cleanse me from the inside out so I would be able to do the work that he has for me. And so I hope that everyone else went to that same place that I did. For if the sprinkling ceremonial unclean persons with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer restores their outward purity, then how much more the blood of the Messiah, who, through the eternal spirit, offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, will purify our conscience from the works that lead to death, so that we can serve the living God. But this one, after he had offered, for all time, a single sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God, from then on to wait until his enemies to make a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has brought us to the goal for all the times those are being set apart for God and made holy. So the sacrifice that we have today is also about giving first fruits. So that's also a part of what we do on Yom Kippur. So I hope that you'll all be um, praying about that. And I just feel that Yom Kippur is really about looking inside and, and really asking God to forgive us for everything in our life so we can move through to another place. So I hope all of you are on the same page that I am. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your words, Janet, and for each one of us, I think we've been trying to bring you a piece of our heart and a piece of our view, how we look at Yom Kippur, that it might not just be ritual, it might not just be repetitiveness, but that it really might grasp hold of us from the inside out. And uh, I, I find it very interesting because uh, Yom Kippur always, for me, I don't know how to explain it, but if you can feel two different ways inside of your body at the same time, by the end of the day, I think I want to explode because my body is so confused. <laughs> One moment, I feel the ex ex exaltation, that, that's not the word I want. I'm, I'm so excited and so enthralled with the fact that on this day, I know my name is written in the book of life. And I know it's not written just for the day, just for a year, but I know it's written for eternity. And as I go into the Holy of Holies in the very presence of my Holy God on the basis of his shed blood, 
I'm rejoicing. My heart is exploding with that excitement, that thankfulness. And, and I always pray, Lord, let it, let it mean it even more. Let me feel it even more in depth than I have before. And then at the very same time, while I'm in that euphoric state because I'm forgiven, I remember my dear Jewish brethren who don't know this, who on this very day are pouring their souls out, pleading, begging, doing all that they can. They've been doing this for so many days now, looking toward this day, and they're going to even go through 25 more hours of just pleading, reading the, the prayers of forgiveness, studying that in the scriptures, hoping. And I think that's the saddest part of all is when we get to the very end of Yom Kippur, they know that in their teachings, the book of life has been closed now. It's been sealed. And so has the book of death. And they don't know which book their name has been written in. They hope it's been written in the book of life. And I think how sad and how hard, and my heart just breaks for those who sincerely want to be right with God, but yet are still caught with a veil of blindness, with ears that are not hearing. Moshe brought that home when he said to the people, you're going to hear, but you're not going to do. Yet God's going to forgive you. And if it never was as strong within me, this year it was really brought home. I lost two people on Yom Kippur. One I know is in heaven, and the other one I don't know. And the difference dealing with two families, with all that this is going on, it just made this day so poignant. It made me realize how important it is that we get out the words of life, that we go, don't sit, please don't sit. Go, look for opportunity. If you're not brave to speak, pass out a tract. Do something. The faces you see that are passing you by, pray for them. God hears and answers prayer. But this isn't something to take lightly. Life can be taken in a moment. The scripture tells us it's like a vapor. And I may not be 99 yet, but I'm far enough down the path that I know how fast life is going. So as I bring you these words, as I bring you the message from the Word of God, it's the living Word of God, and it does give us hope. And it gives us what we call in Scripture our blessed hope, because it's not a I hope so, it's an I know so. And that's what I want to leave you with. I believe that I'm speaking to the choir, but let it refresh you. Let it just drink it in and let it light you on fire. Thomas, the perfect song that we need to burn with a fire to take it and to share it. Some of these verses you've already heard, but I'm going to read through them quickly again to give us our background. Bud Midbar, Numbers 15, 25, and 26. The Kohen, the priest, is to make atonement for the whole community of the people of Israel. The whole community of the people of Israel will be forgiven. Likewise, the foreigners staying with them all within that commonwealth of Israel would be covered. Viagra, Leviticus 23, 27, and 28. The tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You are to have a holy convocation, you are to deny yourselves, and you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. Did you notice there's three things there? A holy convocation, denying yourselves, and bringing an offering made by fire. This is specific. There are many offerings we bring, they're not all by fire, but when we know it's made by fire, that's a sacrifice. That is something that was alive, that is going to spend its life and going to be brought to death at this time. Verse 28, you are not to do any kind of work on that day because it is Yom Kippur to make an atonement for you before Adonai, your God. And if you don't understand the word atonement, the word Kippur, what one did is they broke it down and they said it's at one meant. This is how you become one with God. 
this is what it's talking about when it's atoning for our sins it's taking the sin that separates us and removes it that we can be at one with our God Viagra Leviticus 16 we read some of these verses but I'll read some others too he shall take from the congregation of the sons the community of the people of Israel two male goats as a sin offering he is to take the two goats and place them before Adonai at the entrance to the tent of meeting. That's the door of the tabernacle. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Adonai and the other for the Azazel, the scapegoat, to present the goat whose lot fell to Adonai and offer it as the sin offering. This goat would be put to death. But the goat whose lot fell to Azazel, the scapegoat, is to be presented alive to Adonai to be used for making atonement over it by sending it away in the desert. Next, he is to slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the curtain within the veil, sprinkling it on the ark cover, which is the mercy seat. He will make atonement because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. In this case, when it was being given Aharon, the high priest, he was to lay both his hands on the head of the live goat Confess over it all the transgressions, crimes, the sins of the people of Israel, and then send it away into the desert with a man appointed for the purpose. The goat will bear all the transgressions. That goat, going off into the desert, never to be seen again, was to be a representation of the sin being carried away, that it would be gone and it would be forgotten in God's book. But the other goat was to have its blood shed. These two ghosts, it's very important that this is the offering that was to be made that God had declared. So I like to, to bring it to us the way our Jewish people think. And how do we think? We question everything. <laughs> do we not? So I think we have a problem because I'm reading if I want atonement, I have to make a, an offering by fire, and there's only one place that can be done, and that's in the temple in Jerusalem. But there's no temple. We don't have an altar. We don't have a place we can make a sacrifice. So what do we do? How do we to perform this act with the scapegoat who's going to die in our place? Because there is no temple, does God say, oh, okay, don't worry about it? I don't see that in scripture. And I don't see where he said, when you don't have a temple, you can do this. You can say more prayers. You can have more services. You can do more mitzvot. You can give to the poor and needy. All these are things we do for Yom Kippur. But where does the scripture say that will make me at one with my God? So the question I ask, is every Jew condemned by God, who is acting as judge at Yom Kippur, is every Jew since 70 AD, that's when we lost our temple, when Titus and the Romans destroyed our temple. Have we all been condemned since 70 AD? I'm living in 2021. Is there any hope for me? Is there a substitute permitted by God? Does he give us any indication? What does scripture tell us? I want to look for that scapegoat and see, is there anywhere where we're told how to have a scapegoat apart from the literal at the temple? And I don't have to go far before I'm looking through our prophets to see what they had to say, and I come to Yeshia, and I think I see him speaking about a scapegoat. He speaks in a chapter that we're very familiar with, but I wonder if you've ever looked at it from the point of being the scapegoat. Of course, I'm referring to chapter 53 of Yeshua, Isaiah. Yehovah revealed through our prophet that there would be a person. When you read chapter 53, even though rabbis try to say that this speaks of Israel, read it through and try to put the nation of Israel in there. And you will find by the end of the chapter, there is no way it's a nation. It is a person. So Jehovah's revealing through our prophet that there's a person who's going to be the scapegoat because I read just in verses five and six, he was pierced for our offenses, wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities, crushed for our wrongdoings, for our sins. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him. The Lord, Jehovah, has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He's taking the guilt of us all. Well, isn't that what the scapegoat was to do? Wasn't the scapegoat to take our sin and die in our stead? And now if by the prophet Yeshua, I'm hearing that a person that Jehovah's appointed is going to be the one to do this. So if this is true, if I'm on to something and I am truly seeking to be right with my God, I want to know who this person is. I want to know how to find him. I want to know when, where. I want to know, has it been taken care of? Or is it still to come? So I'm going to keep going through my prophets. I'm going to keep looking for another answer. And I'm going to go to the prophet Daniel. Daniel means my God is judge. And since God is judging us at Yom Kippur, I think this is a good place to stop and take a look and see if Daniel said anything about this person who could be the scapegoat. And I do find something in Daniel. I find it in chapter 9 especially. He gives a great prophecy that spans thousands of years in all honesty, even though they couldn't see and know that at the time. But starting with verse 24, read through verse 27 on your own later. But it's telling us that there's a prophecy that's going to cover 490 years. In the 483rd year, after a certain decree has been issued to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, then Messiah is to be cut off. Now that cut off that is being referred to in verse 26 there in the Hebrew it speaks to it being a violent cut off. This is not just simple, just turning away or not looking. This is Messiah suffering violence. Well, is not putting the animal to death violence? Could this be? Could he be talking to us about the Messiah being the scapegoat in the 483rd year of that prophecy? Well, if I'm on to something, then let me look at that prophecy. Let me look at time. Let me see when that 483rd year is. And this is what I love about our scriptures. God is exact. In our English, he dots every I and he crosses every T. In our Hebrew, not one jot or one tittle is lost. And one of the little markings is lost, is erased, is forgotten, is not proper until everything has been fulfilled. And we have, not just in the Word of God, but we have in secular history, recorded by historians that are respected by all, very few specific dates. But we have a date that fits in with Daniel's prophecy. That prophecy was to start when the decree went out to rebuild not just the temple, but the streets of Jerusalem. During Daniel's time, there were four decrees that went out. Three spoke to the rebuilding of the temple. One, years later another, and a few years later another. But when the decree went out, the fourth decree went out, this is from Artaxerxes in, in the secular, to rebuild, to allow the rebuilding of the streets of Yerushalayim. Well, if you've been with me before, tick talk God's clock and here you have the start you count from there 483 years forward to when Messiah should be cut off violently and you have a violent act that happened in that year it happened to a holy Jewish man this holy Jewish man even claimed to be Mashiach Messiah Yet he was accused of being a false messiah, and he was put to death. Who am I speaking of? I think you all know. I'm speaking of the one called Yeshua the Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene. Crucifixion is a violent cutoff. Foretold in Tehillim, Psalm 22, you can read it and you can see it in, in such detail. And yet that song was written, they think, approximately 700 years before crucifixion was a mode of death. 
when I take that into my chapter in Isaiah 53, talking about that scapegoat, I come down to verse 8 now and I read that he was cut off from the land of the living for the wrongdoing of his own. No, for the wrongdoing of my people. He's dying in their stead. And he's doing it in the 483rd year of Daniel's prophecy that was so exact that it was 1445 B.C. I think I just gave the wrong date. I shouldn't have said it. Anyway, the date is in history. We can look it up. I'll give it to you later. But we could count it down. And if our people had known their prophecy like they should have, they could have lined at the streets to see Messiah come into Yerushalayim and followed what happened that week. That week when Pesach was going on, that week when the lambs were being crucified, I'm sorry, the lambs were being slaughtered, the Lamb of God was crucified. He is the scapegoat, he is the Lamb of God, he is the one that's fulfilling. But remember, they claimed he wasn't the Messiah. They said, no, 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 he's not. And I've been talking with a rabbi recently who said he absolutely was not. If he was Messiah, the kingdom would have been set up. He would have broken Rome's, what Rome was binding us with. He did not fulfill his mission. He failed. And I think, oh, if you could only know. He came as the scapegoat. He came as the lamb. He came to fulfill the suffering servant that we read of in Tehillim, Psalm 22. He came to fulfill all of this. He will come back as king. He will rule and reign from Yerushalayim. Zion will see the glory of the Lord fill the temple, and it will fill the face of this earth. But in between, I look at another one of our prophets. I look at my prophet, Yermia. And I want to see, is this the right one? I think I've got the right one because it sure fits time-wise. And there isn't anybody else in that 483rd year that I could look at and say, this one could possibly be. There's not even a, a close runner-up. It's either Mashiach, the one that we call Yeshua the Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene, or we're missing a key person here, according to Daniel's prophecy. And Jeremiah gave us words about it too because he said that there'd be a new covenant. Well, to have a new covenant, the old has to be obsolete. It has to be cut off. It's cut off by a death. Is there a death that's cutting off the first covenant? And I suddenly hear the words of this one that they don't want to believe is Messiah, Yeshua at Pesach. We read it in our Brit Hadashah, in our new covenant. But what we're reading is his keeping the Seder. And as he was keeping the Seder, he took the matzah. He made a barucha, a blessing over the matzah. We know the blessing well, do we not? He broke it and he gave it to his Talmudim and he declared, this is my body which has been given for you. Some versions even say, this is my body which is broken for you. Could he have been taking what we have been doing since, and there's my 1445 BC. It was 445 BC in Daniel's prophecy. About 1445 BC, we're back to Moshe's time, and he's taking what we've been doing every year, but he's suddenly personalizing it. Remember, God said there would be a person who would fill this for us. Not an animal, a person. He further took another step, and with our third cup, the very cup called the cup of redemption, he picked that up, made a baruch again, and then he said to his Talmudim, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant. There's those words, what Jeremiah said, is the new covenant. But then he adds on, in my blood. Was he telling them? His blood was going to be shed to make a new covenant, that to fulfill Jeremiah's words, to be on time with what was prophesied by Daniel, to fulfill Isaiah 53. Wow. It fits like pieces in a puzzle. I don't see any room for doubt, and yet I want to look further. And so looking in this, this book, 
that someone wants to call the Christian side, and that's so misleading and so wrong. This continuation of our Jewish story. I read in the Berachat Shah words by another good Jewish boy. His name was Shaol. Originally, he got changed to Paul. But he declared, and he wrote it to people living in a place called Corinth. It's chapter 15, and it's verses 3 and 4, and he spells it out. This Jewish boy says, the Messiah. And he should know, because he knew our prophets. He studied our scriptures. The Messiah died for our sins. He didn't say he's still coming to do it. He said it's done. And he said he did it in accordance with what the Tanakh, our original covenant, said. He was buried. He raised on the third day in accordance with what the Tanakh says. When Shaul wrote his second letter to the people in Corinth, he made it even more clear. In chapter 5 and verse 21, he says, God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf. Whoa, if that does not wake up every Jewish person who knows that that, scape, that goat was a sin offering. And now he's saying this man, this Messiah, this one who in the 483rd year of Daniel's prophecy was violently cut off by crucifixion, this man shed his blood. This man was a sin offering on our behalf. Why? So that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. And I've got it. I can sing the hallelujah. This sin offering is the one that's going to make me at one with my God. This is the one who was promised, who shed his blood, sinless blood, so that I could have forgiveness of my sin. Kepha, another good Jewish boy who wrote another book in our Baruch Hadashah, in his first letter with his name, says in chapter 2, and verse 24, he himself, speaking of the Messiah, the same one Sha'ol Paul was speaking of, bore our sins in his body on the stake so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. This is how I can get right with my God. This closes the circle of Isaiah 53, where verse 12 says, He poured out his life unto death. He himself bore the sin of many. If this is true, then I'm not condemned since 70 AD. I'm not condemned in 2021. No one has to be condemned all the time from 70 AD forward and however far we go into the future by simply stepping into that scapegoat's blood, into that place of the sacrifice. Now I am free from condemnation. If Daniel is right, it had to be a kinsman. This Redeemer had to come out of our heritage, out of our line. And we find Mashiach was of the line of David. He is in the line all the way back. Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, all the way down through David. He fits it perfectly. He had to come in flesh and he had to come in Jewish flesh if he was going to be the fulfillment and he did. And trusting in him, in this blood that God said all the way back in the Torah, and Bruce read it earlier, Leviticus, Viacra chapter 17 and verse 11, that God would put the blood on the seat, on the mercy seat for atonement. God would give it. Not that I merit it, not that I say enough prayers, not that I beg it long enough for forgiveness, not that I do the good mitzvot, not that I take care of the poor and the needy and that I do make everything right, not anything that I merit. God said, I have put it there. I have given it to you. And if God didn't do it in the person of Mashiach, when did God do it? And what do we do with the 483rd year of the prophecy of Daniel who said it had to be then. But I know this is right. I know that every prophecy agrees that there is not one left unfulfilled of the, the suffering servant and there's not one moment that's missed right down to the day and the hour that he shed his blood. And in being sinless, it's for the forgiveness of my sins, your sins, of all who come to believe 
they get eternal life. They get to know that their name is written in his book of life. Janet's favorite word. Say it. Forever. This is eternal life with our Messiah. It is abundant life. Remember those verses that he died, was buried, but he rose that he can give us newness of life. This is the fulfillment. Even our Talmudic version of Yom Kippur, our Yomah, even says there is no atonement except by blood. So, dear rabbis and those like them, forgive me. But your prayers, adding prayers, afflicting the soul, which you do by fasting, and I don't see how that afflicts the soul. That afflicts the body. <laughs> my body gets hungry. My body gets thirsty. It's not what my soul does, except it gets thirsty for my God. But God doesn't give any room for a substitute. No substitutes are allowed. And furthermore, no substitutes are necessary because another wonderful book for our Jewish people. Goes by the name of Hebrews. You think that's for the Hebrew people? You think that would be a kosher book to read? I think so. And the key word, if you want one word to sum up the whole book of Hebrews, is the word better. Everything in it, Hebrews tells us about the better. The better tabernacle, the better high priest, the better blood, everything. And in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, but when the Messiah appeared as Kohen Gadol, as the great high priest, uh, the good things that are happening already, then through the greater and the more perfect tent, the better tabernacle, which wasn't man-made, that means it's not in this created world. That means there's one in heaven that we know it was patterned after on earth. He entered that holiest place. He entered once and for all, and he entered not by means of the blood of goats, not by means of the blood of the scapegoat, not by the blood of calves, and we know not by the blood of the lambs. He entered by means of his own blood, thus setting people free. Janet? Forever. Forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got it. This is why my heart just explodes on Yom Kippur. I can be right in the most holiest, holy of holies in the heavenly, in the midst of my God because he put the blood on the altar for me. I don't need to look for a scapegoat. I don't need to look for someone else. I don't need to look through time. I have everything. He is Messiah. He is scapegoat. He is the sin offering. He is the anointed one. He is the administrator of the new covenant. And by power of his virtuous death and resurrection, he redeems me from my sin. I'm set free from the covenant that brought death. And I am set free to enjoy eternal reconciliation with Elohim Haim, the most high God. Yes, clap. Yes, express it. Hallelujah. This is how we get to be holy in the presence of a holy God. This is the covenant God promised. He promised it via the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And it's given to us again by Jeremiah. Chapter 31, our prophet Jeremiah. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Adonai. I will put my Torah within them, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickednesses, their wrongdoings. I will remember their sins no more. Again, I love it. Hallelujah. <laughs> we just praise him. He gives us remission of sins. There's no question. There's no further atonement. There's no other shedding of blood. There's no substitutes. There's nothing else we need to do. We just simply need to not harden our heart, but allow him to write it on our hearts. And when he has, then we even see like a Yeshia where we started. Isaiah, a little earlier than chapter 53. In chapter 6, he said, oh, woe is me of unclean lips. And the seraphim took a coal from the altar, touched his lips, and said, your guilt has been taken away. Picture of the altar taking away our sin. 
But sadly, as Shia goes on, and he says, they're going to listen, but they're not going to understand. They're going to know, but they're not going to get it into their hearts. Their ears are dull, their eyes are blind. What are they missing? He did it all. We have it in him. Quit trying. Quit working at it. You'll never make it. Because Isaiah also said in chapter 64, 6, all our righteousness, that means my best, the best of my best, according to God's standard, is as filthy rags. That would devastate me. That would leave me, how do I ever get it right? But it's not me. My God did it all. His name is Yeshua, and I can't praise him enough. And I take you back to that moment I heard again of two who left this earth. One that I know had it written in his heart, and one that I wonder. She heard Isaiah 53 in the last week of her life. She heard other things too. I hope in the, the quietness of her deathbed, she opened her heart, but I encourage you, if I'm wrong and any here haven't opened their hearts, don't miss heaven by 18 inches. Don't get full of knowledge up here and not let God apply it to your heart. And if it's in your heart, go, tell, shout it from the mountaintop, say it in the valleys, go across the street, go around the corner, go next door and do it in your own home. But be so thankful for the greatest gift that you can't stay silent. Go tell that others can know. Amen. He did it all. Hallelujah. 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 I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I am done. <laughs> So if you know it, sing along. I'm not going to sing all the verses. Because, <laughs> first of all, they're in English, so. She does it in Hebrew. I do it in Hebrew. Well, you know, there's only one, one verse. But you can sing along. If I'll sing it for you at least twice. You can sing along. I don't alarm, I share my love, but terror cold, it's in a bra. The ace of soul, the chef so cold, the sign of love, shimon, I don't alarm. I don't alarm, I don't alarm, I share my love, I share my love, but terror cold, the terror cold, it's in a bra. The ace of soul, the chef so cold. A sign of love, Shimon, a crop, I don't know, Lum. <laughs> next time. They'll be here next time. They'll be here next time. <laughs> what? She wants you to learn it for next time. Well, I'd be happy to learn it. I would learn it this time. But I, I, I would play the whole thing for her. She can sing it again. Okay. It's really a tongue twister, actually. But the next time we sing it is actually Passover. I think it'll be Passover. We can sing it. Can we can sing, sing it, it next week. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Right? Okay. So the translation's partly here, right? Yes. The translation's there. But if you say it in Hebrew, it's a tongue twister. Right. Before I, I do the ironic benediction, do you want to have a moment of prayer? I think we should. Yes. So there's uh, many things to, to pray about. Um, and, you know, for, for one, I think the message of tonight is so important that we pray about and that we actually not only hear the message, but we do it. We go 
and we speak to our neighbors, we speak to those around us that are Jewish, and we take a chance and, and say something, even if it's, um, you know, this, this next week is Sukkot, it's the, the festival of the, the tabernacles and of the booths, and so there's, there's plenty of holidays, and then comes more holidays about the giving of the law, and so there's so many things that we can talk to our, and I'm convinced that every one of us probably runs in, in this valley, if you pay attention, just like Rochelle was saying, those faces that you see in front of you, I don't know, I would say probably five out of a hundred are Jewish at least, maybe more, um, especially beginning now uh, as we go forward. So take, take time and pray for those. I know we need to uh, pray for, um, for J our friend Judy, for, for um, Jeannie Bratrude. We need to pray for um, the family, all of our families. All of us have family members that don't know Messiah too, or that have turned away from Messiah. Uh, and we pray that they come back. Some of them may have confessed when they were young we have siblings or maybe aunts or uncles or cousins or people that don't know Yeshua, don't know Jesus. And we need to be out there speaking the word to them and demonstrating love to them in a way that's real and meaningful to them. Uh, are there any other, Rochelle, prayer requests for two families for sure? Stubborn Eddie, we're going to play, pray for Stubborn Eddie. We're going to pray for yeah. Eddie that he's not any longer stubborn. When, when, you know, when you're going to meet with him, what day? Sunday morning. Sunday morning you're going to meet with him. For Eddie, a 99 year old. We need to continue to pray for the health of some of our loved ones. We need to pray for, for Simon's health, uh, it's Fathan's husband, um, and what's that? Tony's knees, yes. Uh, we need to pray for um, Hillary, is, uh, has some needs that she wants us always to pray for her brother. I know uh, that's one thing that she always wants us to pray for. She's, she's not with us tonight. Uh, we need to pray for the, just our, our getting our message to those around us. Yes, Jen? Always, always, she reminded me, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Always pray for, um, you know, our brother Abraham, who is with us on Monday nights. We often pray for uh, his, his, his home country of India, his one of his siblings, I think his brother, in fact, has basically has started over 250 churches in the country of India. And, you know, there's many people that have been suffering from COVID. Uh, we need to continue to pray for, for me, the family of Hunter Lopez, who gave his life on August 26th. His, his family is part of this valley. Um, and, you know, they just been, he, his life was taken. Uh, at 22 years of age. So like Rochelle said, we never know for sure the day or the hour that we're gonna be called. And we need to continue to pray for blessing for, uh, for Pastor Chris and for the mission of Cornerstone as well. And we're, we're part of that mission. And so we need to just continue to pray and all of us have a long list and we're, you're all invited to join us on Monday night. If you want, there's a phone in time and we can join in with that time as well. So also, um, we're gonna try to have, in addition to having a Messianic uh, concert, classical piano event on January 21st here, we're also we're thinking about whether God would have us to invite um, Thomas's favorite artist, well, Marty, but also Paul Wilbur. We're thinking about maybe maybe trying to reach out to Paul Wilbur 
or, or maybe Stuart Dowerman again. We're hoping to maybe bring somebody else this year as well because for, the, for 19 months we haven't been able to be together and have it. So we, we like to have somebody once a year come and join us and just, uh, just encourage us to love and good works. And that's really, so we've been able to do that. And we're hoping to do some of that this next year as well. And of course, um, we've got a number of events coming up. So if you're not on our mailing list, email us, please let us know and we'll add you to that. Thank you all <laughs> for coming tonight. Our wonderful dancers and your families. So wonderful to see you. We hope to see you again, each and every one. Eva Rachachar and I, Vaishmarecha, Yair Adonai Panav Alecha, Vechunecha, Yisa Adonai Panav Alecha, Shabbat Shalom.